Hello and welcome to the Mercury Project, Mercury Atlas 8. The original Mercury Atlas 8 flight plan was issued on July 27th, although it was revised slightly in August and September. It remained broadly unchanged until launch. This was important on the situation with MA-7, which had frequent and extensive altercations, making it difficult for the pilot to train effectively. The aim for the flight was the engineering-oriented mission, focusing on the operations of spacecraft rather than the scientific experimentation, to help pave the way for future long-duration missions. Astronaut Sharar chose the name Sigma-7 for the capsule in reflection of this focus, using the mathematical symbol for summaration as appropriate for an engineering evaluation, and the seven to refer to the seven Mercury astronauts. This mission objective involved evaluating and performance of the spacecraft over six orbits, as well as the effect of prolonged microgravity on the pilot. The specific spacecraft systems would also be evaluated and tested, and the worldwide tracking and communication network would be tested to see how well it could stand up in an extended mission. The flight control experiments included manually turning the spacecraft around, yaw and pitch maneuvers to determine how easy it was to control the spacecraft altitude, realignment of onboard gyroscopes in flight, and leaving the spacecraft to drift on orbit. Spacecraft Modifications The spacecraft and booster were almost identical to those used on the two preceding Mercury orbital flights. The spacecraft had heating blankets removed from the retro rocket motors to save weight, and the so far bomb was added. This would be ejected at the time that the main parachute was deployed, and would help recovery crews find the spacecraft after it landed. A number of modifications were made to the reaction control system, and the communication equipment was upgraded. The Atlas Booster Vehicle 113D had been modified since the previous flight, and now included baffled fuel injectors and a new hypergolic fuel indicator instead of the original pyrotechnic igniter. This would completely eliminate problems with combustion instability and allow the booster to be released immediately upon a training full thrust instead of being held on the pad for a few moments. There were considerable delays getting the vehicle ready for flight. It was supposed to be shipped to Cape Canaveral in July, but after failing the factory composite test at Convair, the planned delivery of Atlas was delayed a month. Launch! Astronaut Sharar was wakened at 1.40 a.m. Eastern Time on the morning of October 3rd. After a hearty breakfast, including a bluefish he had speared the day before, and a brief physical, he left for the launch pad around 4 a.m. He entered the spacecraft at 4.41 a.m. Eastern Time, where he found a steak sandwich left for him in the glove compartment and began the pre-launch checks. The launch countdown proceeded as planned until 6.15, when there was a 15-minute hold to allow the Canary Island tracking station to repair a radar set. The countdown resumed at 6.30 and the preceding booster ignition with no further delays. Liftoff proceeded smoothly, but there was a momentary clockwise roll transient at liftoff which reached 7.83 degrees per second and approached 80% of the required threshold ASIS abort system. This was later identified as being due to a slight misalignment of the main engines and was kept under control by the booster's vernier thrusters. Sustainer engine thrust during the launch was slightly below normal and the fuel consumption higher than normal due to a suspected leak in the sustainer fuel system. Around three and a half minutes into the flight, Deke Slayton, the capsule commander, cut in to ask Shara, are you a turtle today? Shara, unfazed, announced that he was switching to the onboard voice recorder rather than broadcast radio circuit to leave his answer. The mission communication transcripts noted this as correct answer recorded. The turtle club was a recurrent joke among astronaut corps. On being challenged with this question, the correct response was, You bet your sweet ass I am, with the failure to give the password being punishable by buying a round of drinks. 
Shira noted later that he wasn't ready for all the world to hear it, and chose to use the onboard recorder to avoid saying the answer over the air. Because the Atlas was flying on slightly lofted trajectory, the booster engine cut off two seconds earlier than planned. But the sustainer engine burned for about 10 seconds longer than intended, giving an extra 15 feet per second of velocity and putting the spacecraft in a slightly higher orbit than planned. Initial analysis of the trajectory confirmed that the capsule would remain in a stable orbit for at least seven orbits, ensuring that there would be no need for an early deorbit. Orbital Activities After separating from the Atlas booster, Shira stabilized the spacecraft and slowly cartwheeled into the correct altitude. He deliberately kept the motion slow to conserve fuel and was able to position the capsule using half a percent of his fuel reserves. He tracked the spent booster which was rotating slowly past but made no attempt to move towards it. As the spacecraft moved across the Atlantic, he turned his attention to testing the manual control of the spacecraft which he found to be sloppy compared to the fly-by-wire system. Crossing over the eastern coast of Africa, he began to feel overheated. This problem was also apparent to the ground controls, who were having a debate with the flight surgeon over whether or not it was safe to continue or if the mission should be ended after its first orbit. The flight director, Christopher Kraft, followed the surgeon's advice to see if the problem would settle, and gave the go for a second orbit. Shira eventually stabilized the problem over time, slowly dialing the suit's knob to a higher cooling system. He compared the heat to that of mowing a lawn in Texas. Over Australia, Shira watched for a flare launch from the ground, but it was blocked by clouds. He was, however, able to see lightning and the lit outside of Brisbane. Through the night pass over the Pacific, he tested the capsule's onboard periscope, though he found it to be difficult to use converted up as soon as the sun rose. Crossing over Mexico, he reported that he was in chimp configuration, with the capsule running entirely on automatic without any input from the pilot. And as he began his second orbit, began testing a yaw maneuver using the Earth through the main window as a reference, rather than using the periscope. On the second orbit, he confirmed the existence of Glenn's fireflies, the shower of small bright particles first reported on MA6, and during the night section, practice yaw maneuvers using the moon and then known stars as reference points. The second proved difficult to work with, as the small windows of the Mercury capsule gave a very limited field of view, making it hard to identify constellations. Traveling across the Pacific, he fell again into automatic flight, chatting with Gus Grissom at the Hawaiian tracking station about the qualities of the manual control system. As he began the third orbit, Shira disconnected the spacecraft's gyroscopes, turned off part of the electrical power system, and let the capsule drift. He took advantage of this quiet period to test his spatial awareness and motor control, which he had found was broadly unaffected by weightlessness, and to eat a light meal. At Hawaii, he was given clearance for a full six-orbit mission, and as he crossed over towards California, shut down the electrical power for a second period of drifting, during which he occupied himself by taking photographs with the onboard camera. On the fourth orbit, drifting in an inverted spacecraft with the Earth above him, Shira continued his photography and attempted unsuccessfully to spot the Echo 1 satellite while passing over East Asia. As he approached California, he spoke briefly to John Glenn in a two-minute conversation broadcast live across the United States on radio and television. Problems began to reoccur with the pressure suit, with water condensing on the faceplate. Shira, concerned about the internal temperature, avoided opening the visor to clean it for fear that the suit temperature would misbehave again. By the fifth orbit, Shira had began to relax, commenting that it was the first rest he had had since December 1961. He used a small bungee cord exercise device for a little bit of stretching before dropping into manual altitude control when he reported a sudden burst of oversteering and high fuel use. Over the Atlantic, he returned to observation and photography. He failed to spot the high planed high power light near Durban in South Africa due to cloud cover, 
but did make out briefly the lit city of Port Elizabeth. Over the Philippines, he reported on his fuel status. After four and a half of the planned six orbits, he still had 80% remaining in both manual and automatic fuel tanks. Passing over Ecuador, towards the end of his fifth orbit, Shara was asked by the tracking station if he had any messages to pass on in Spanish to the fellows down there. And he made some comments on how beautiful the country appeared from orbit, ending with a cheery, Buenos dias, y'all. Shara later noted that he was furious at this point. He was preparing for re-entry and didn't want to be distracted with making public statements. The sixth orbit was dominated by preparations for re-entry. Though Shara was able to take a last set of photographs of South America and try another set of spatial orientation tests. He aimed the retro rockets passing over the western Pacific and fired the first one at 8.52 mission elapsed time. The automatic control system held the capsule steady as a rock during this period. Though the retro rockets had stopped firing, Shara noted that the system had burned almost a quarter of its fuel in the process, re-entry and recovery. As the spacecraft continued towards re-entry after the deorbit burn, Shara used his high power thrusters to put the capsule in the correct orientation, noting that the altitude control felt sloppy. He then enabled the rate stabilization control system, an automatic control method which used up fuel at a very high rate, to maintain control during re-entry. This was a specific engineering request, and it dismayed Shara to see the fuel that he had husband for six orbits be used so quickly. The local recovery group in the prime target area in the Central Pacific consisted of the aircraft carrier USS Kursarge in the center of the landing area, with three destroyers strung out along the orbital path. Four search aircraft were also assigned to the area and three recovery helicopters were based on board the Kursarge. Kursarge picked up the capsule on radar while still 200 miles from landing. 90 miles further up the landing path, the destroyer USS Renshaw reported a sonic boom as it passed overhead. At 40,000 feet, Shara deployed the Drogue parachute and the main parachute at 15,000 feet. The landing was surprisingly precise. 4.5 miles from the target point and 0.5 miles from the curse arch. And Shara joked that he was on course for the recovery carrier's number three elevator. The capsule hit the water, submerged, and bobbed to the surface again, righting itself after about 30 seconds. Three pararescue swimmers were dropped by one of the helicopters to help him climb out, but Shara radioed that he would prefer to be towed to the carrier and a whaleboat from Kursarge was sent with a line. Forty minutes after landing, Sigma-7 was hoisted on board the Kursarge. Five minutes later, Shara blew the explosive hatch and climbed out to a waiting crowd. After doing this, examination showed clear bruisings on his hand from operating the heavy ejector switch, which he felt provided an important vindication for fellow pilot Gus Grissom's hatch expulsion accident during the Liberty 7 mission. Grissom has maintained that the hatch blew without his input. The fact that he had no bruising was seen as evidence that he had not blown the hatch early and sunk his capsule, but that it was a mechanical malfunction. Shara remained on board for three days of medical tests and debriefing before disembarking. While the spacecraft was offloaded at Midway Island and transferred to an aircraft for further transport, it was returned to Cape Canaveral for analysis, with the long-term intention of putting it on permanent display. The spent Atlantis booster re-entered the atmosphere on October 4th, the day after the launch, and burned up. Spacecraft Location After display at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center and Johnson Space Center, the capsule was moved to the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame near Titusville, Florida. Since the recent relocation of the Astronaut Hall of Fame to the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, Sigma-7 has most recently been placed on display at the complex New Hero and Legends Hall. Thank you for watching the history of the Mercury Project.
Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you already have, then thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.